Hello, welcome to the third and final installment in this series by Bible Truth Niagara about our unique Savior. Finally, we get to the really important concept that the first two videos have been leading up to. Once again, I will be using the New International Version translation of the Bible, and I encourage you to pause the video when I mention a Bible reference so that you can take the time to look it up for yourself. If you have not yet viewed the first two videos, I urge you to, because in them, it was found that our Savior Jesus Christ was unique in two remarkable ways. First, when he walked this earth 20 centuries ago, he had the exact same human nature as you and I, except that unlike every other person who has ever lived, Jesus was completely sinless. Then, after his resurrection, he became the one and only immortal human, which of course he still is today. Now, here's the question. Why is any of this important? How can knowing this help a person in their life right now today, and how can it affect their future? I propose that understanding the true nature of Christ before his death and after his resurrection is vitally important for this significant reason. Because it provides you and I with the motivation and the path by which we can attain immortality ourselves. In a nutshell, because Jesus was like us, by following his example, we can become like him. Now, I'm not saying that we can be sinless like Christ, nor am I saying that his sacrificial death did not atone for our sins. I do believe that faith in Christ is essential for salvation. However, I also agree with the book of James that faith alone is not enough. This faith must be accompanied by progressive works of faith as well. I suggest that God sent Jesus not only to be our Savior, but also as our pioneering trailblazer to lead us to eternal life, and whose example we, with his help, are to follow the best we can. God wants us to succeed in reaching our full potential in overcoming sin in our lives. In fact, at Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Jesus himself tells us that the Father is pleased to give us the kingdom. In other words, God wants to grant us immortality. He's not willing that any should perish, as it says in 2 Peter 3, verse 9. Jesus was born human, and so, of course, were we. Jesus voluntarily listened to, trusted, and obeyed God the best he could, and so can we. Jesus had two motivations in his life. He loved God, and he loved his fellow man. These can also be our motivations, and Jesus became an immortal human with much more significant work to do for God, and this can be our reward as well. Here's how I like to illustrate this concept. Imagine that you are attempting to climb to the top of an icy hill. You start off by climbing part of the way up and find yourself sliding helplessly right back down to the bottom. You repeat this over and over again, trying your best, but getting nowhere. Soon enough, you start thinking to yourself, I can't do this. This is impossible. Why should I even keep trying? And you're ready to give up. Then, you notice a man approaching that same icy hill. This man is taller than you, obviously stronger, and he's wearing special boots with metal ice picks on the soles. You watch as this super person easily conquers those slippery slopes and quickly arrives at the summit. Then, you see his two outstretched hands beckoning you to follow him up the hill. What do you do? I know what I'd do. I'd think to myself, you have got to be kidding. I've, I'm not as tall or strong as you, and I don't have special boots. I've already tried my best and failed. It's no use trying again. And I would walk away defeated. Now, imagine the same scene again. The same icy hill, 
Once again, you repeatedly try to climb it and fail. Once again, you are ready to give up. But this time, you notice another man approaching the hill. This man is your exact same height and build, and he's wearing the same kind of boots that you are. You watch intently as he begins to struggle his way up the hill using simple tactics that you did not think to try yourself. You sense he's had some kind of special training. As he steadily inches his way upward, you admire his focused persistence. And after a long, hard climb, he's nearing the top. You don't even know this guy, but you're starting to get more and more excited the higher he climbs. When he finally steps triumphantly onto that summit, you are absolutely elated. You're clapping your hands and whistling and giving him two thumbs up. You are grinning from ear to ear. Then you see his two outstretched hands beckoning you to follow him up the hill. What do you do this time? I think I know what I'd do. First, I think to myself, I've just watched this person, who is the same as me in every way, achieve the goal that I would like to reach. And it looks like he's willing to guide me along to help me if I try again. So it might actually be possible for me after all. I start to feel inspired and hopeful and with renewed enthusiasm. I would try again. Wouldn't you? Imagine yourself climbing part of the way up the first time and sliding right back down to the bottom. But this time, your mentor yells down encouragement and instructions to you, so you keep trying. Backsliding often, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, but every time you try again, you find yourself climbing higher than the time before. You start to get really tired, but you don't quit because you've come so far and you know that you will eventually succeed if you just keep focused on following the example and instructions of your leader. When you reach the steepest slope near the top, you see his hand reaching down for you. As you stretch up to grab it, you lose your footing, but he's got you, and he pulls you up those last few feet. You can hardly believe it. You're actually there. You have made it. Not only do you finally get to meet your new friend face to face, but you're hugging each other and jumping up and down and yelling and screaming together for joy. You are so happy. And you are so thankful. You know that you could not have done this alone. This amazingly kind and patient stranger didn't have to help you, but he did. And he couldn't have helped you if you were not willing to try and persist but you did. You have achieved your goal together and now you rejoice together. You know that you will be friends for life. Now, let's relate this analogy to our goal of eternal life in the Kingdom of God. We know that we cannot get there by ourselves. We need the help of a Savior. But how exactly does that work? How does the Bible describe that process? There is a common idea among many Christians that sees Jesus as part of a triune Godhead who left his divine existence in heaven to be born in Bethlehem as a baby. But not just any ordinary baby. This Jesus was 100% human and 100% divine. He grew up, ministered for three and a half years, teaching and healing, died on the cross in payment for all our sins, was resurrected and then returned to heaven. With this view, I see little to no commonality between us and Jesus at all. We are unable to truly identify with him because the gap is too large. It's like the difference between us and that first hill climber with the special boots. How can we possibly hope to succeed in following the example of a person who is so much superior to us? And how can he truly sympathize with our weaknesses so as to be able to help us to deal with them. <clears throat> but if Jesus was like the second hill climber, a fellow human being exactly the same as us, whose sole advantage was specialized training from God, 
and he blazed the perfect trail for us to follow him into the kingdom, then the many Bible verses urging us to follow Christ make sense. Let's look at one in the book of 1 Peter, where in chapter 2, at verse 21, the apostle is discussing unjust suffering. He tells us, To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And at Hebrews 12, 2 and 3, we're told to fix our eyes on Jesus. Why? So that we will not grow weary and lose heart. Yes, we can identify with this Jesus enough to expect reasonable success if we choose to follow his teaching and his example. Jesus didn't just tell us what God wanted of us. He showed us in a context that we can understand and relate to. There's a wonderful poem about this by Edgar Guest, which begins with these words. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eyes a better pupil and more willing than the ear. Find counsel? It's confusing. But example is always clear. And isn't that so true? Example is one of the simplest yet most powerful ways of teaching anything. God created you and I. He knows what it takes to motivate us and He wants us to succeed. Our Father in Heaven loved us so much that He provided in His Son the maximum motivation for us to be able to do just that. So why is it important for us to understand the true nature of Christ before His death and after His resurrection? It's because knowing that supplies us with the needed motivation and the true path to eternal life in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus was exactly like us, by following his example, living our lives by the same basic principles that he lived his, we can become exactly like him, immortal humans with the privilege of together serving our loving Heavenly Father forever. So when we struggle in life, when we do suffer unjustly, or when we're tempted to do wrong, we can know that we are not alone in our experience. Jesus is alive and aware and understands what we're going through. He is beckoning to us with his outstretched, nail-imprinted hands to follow him up the slippery slopes of life to the wonderful prize of immortality in God's kingdom. And he is more than willing and very able to help us on our journey. That's why at the end of the book of Matthew, just before he leaves to ascend to heaven, he tells his disciples, Surely I am with you always, to the very end of the age. What he was telling them was that even though he would now be leaving them in body, he would not be leaving them in spirit or in power. That very famous poem entitled Footprints in the Sand is a wonderful description of how the unseen Jesus carries us through the difficult times in our lives. Let's finish off by looking at the book of Hebrews in chapter 4, where at verse 15 and 16, the Apostle Paul is telling us that because Jesus is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, the logical outworking of that fact is that we can then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. There is real hope for all of us because of Jesus Christ, our unique Savior. Let's all strive to follow him the best we can, knowing that it is possible with his help to join him at the top of the hill and there to rejoice together in anticipation of sharing immortal lives of happy service to our wise and wonderful God. This concludes this series of videos by Bible Truth Niagara. There will be a fourth addendum video to this class which will have on it the entire poem by Edgar Guest put to music. We have many other videos on different Bible topics as well and we pray that they will all be of value to you in that they will get you looking deeper into the Holy Scriptures. 
1 Thessalonians 5.21 tells us to prove all things. So don't just take our word for it. Search the scriptures yourself and prove to yourself what really is the truth about any spiritual matter. We'd love to hear your comments or questions and you can contact us through YouTube. Thank you so much for your time and interest today. God bless you. Bye now.